Next presenter on the Skype call, we have uh, Ed Charbonneau, who is going to be talking about authoring custom components on Blazor. Ed, how's it going? Uh, it's going great. Thanks again for having me on .NETCOM. Hey, thank you for always taking your time uh, vol and volunteering your talent with this great conference. Uh, what do you got in, in store for us today? So I'm going to share some tips and tricks on creating some components in Blazor, and then we'll learn a little bit about building a component library that we can share on NuGet. Excellent. Take it away, Ed. All right, so welcome back to .NET Conf. My name is Ed Charbonneau. I work for a company called Progress. You might know us by Telerik because we build the Telerik brand of UI components. And we've been building our Telerik UI for Blazor components since 2018. So we've got some experience with building components and I wanted to share some things with you all today. And I've got this uh, little bit of an agenda set up. We don't have a whole lot of time, so we're gonna cover a lot of material really fast. So if you have questions, please pop those into Twitter uh, using the .NET Comp hashtag. And you could also tweet me directly uh, by my name. Uh, so we're going to cover child content and templates. And then we're going to look at how events are handled and how we can build nice APIs around those events with our components. And then we'll push some of these components into a Razor class library so you can see how uh, to build your own component library libraries and share those on NuGet or share them within your organization as NuGet packages. So as we go through these demos, again, I'm going to be typing uh, very little, and I might be using some of my snippets that I've shared on the Visual Studio Marketplace. So you can find those on Visual Studio Marketplace under the Blazor Pro Code Snippets uh, v6 installer. So if you see, see me using those in Visual Studio, that's where you can get them. So we're going to talk about child content, child content and templates first. Uh, one way to make sure your components are nice and flexible is to make sure that you can uh, allow users to customize them and add templated regions. And what we're going to focus on is this problem statement of how can I maintain a list and count the items within a list uh, using uh, child components and templates. And uh, this was a question that I actually grabbed off of Stack Overflow at one point. And uh, somebody was asking how to count the number of components inside of a UI container. So I'm going to show you how to do that uh, in just a few easy steps. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to be using to build these components, uh, when we talk about child content, uh, this is a template that we get uh, through convention in Blazor. So we're going to use the uh, child content uh, uh, convention, and that is a render fragment object type. Uh, so this is something specific to Razor components. And when we want to build these template sections, we'll be using render fragments. So these are objects that get uh, injected into our render tree when our components are built. Uh, so you can only have one child content uh, field in your component. And uh, we'll look at ways to add multiple sections with templates uh, later on. And we'll do that through a named template. So we can have one or more of these uh, on like the child content template or child content parameter. We can have multiple uh, content templates. So in, in this quick example, we have a loading and a content template and we can set up special uh, regions within our, our t uh, within our component where we can add custom uh, markup in, in UI. Uh, we'll also look at the type parameter or T item uh, type of template where we use a generic uh, list type of uh, component in Blazor so we can iterate over some data and build up a templated UI. So this is going to be super handy. Uh, we'll jump into events after we get done uh, with some of our uh, project here. Um, so let's, let's start off real quick again with that problem statement. We're going to look at how to maintain a list of items a list of components and get the count of items that are in it. So we'll use some data binding to do that. But first we need a component to work with. So I'm going to start with a single alert message. Let's use uh, some bootstrap code here. I'm just going to pop in a quick div element. And I've got the bootstrap class of alert and alert danger on there. We can go ahead and load this up in our project. For the most part, this project is the hello world experience that you always get with file new project. So we have our counter component in our index page and a fetch data example in here. We're going to modify these as we go along. 
And they're just simply using some Bootstrap CSS. We have our first uh, piece of markup. So this is just uh, a regular div class. It's not a component yet. So let's use, <clears throat> let's add a new component so we can reuse this as a reusable component in Blazor. So I'm going to click File, Add, and add a Razor component to my project. And I'm putting these underneath of a component uh, folder over here in my project. This is going to help me organize them uh, just a little bit better. And you can see I've already got some preloaded components in here that we'll talk about uh, near the end. So I've got some spinner components that I'm going to use later on. So we'll keep adding to this folder here. And I'm going to create an alert message. So my alert message component. And for my alert message component, I'm just going to take that same code that's on our index page. And we're just going to move that over to this file. So now I've got my alert message in a component. So for all intents and purposes, it is a component already, uh, but it has a static message here. So we want to be able to allow users to customize this internal uh, message. And I want to do more than allow them to pass a string. I want them to be able to control the inner HTML for this component. So I want, them, I want the the consumer to be able to replace that span tag with whatever HTML they would like. So that's where our child uh, content comes in handy. So I'm going to create a code block here. And I'm going to use my Blazor Pro code snippet pack that I've installed from Visual Studio Marketplace. And I'm going to type para cc and hit tab. And that's going to set up a parameter that is a render fragment called child content. Now, if I reference my child content up in side of my component code, like that, IntelliSense finishes it out for me. And now the user of this component can specify that inner HTML. So we'll go back to our index page, and we can set up an alert component. So I have my alert message. And notice the namespace here is really, really long. Uh, this is because, by default, our components are inheriting their namespace from the, the folder structure uh, that they're placed in. So I'm going to take this namespace out, and I'm just going to move it to my imports. So I'll just put a using statement right inside of my imports file. So this is going to be component libs, components matching my directory here in my solution. So we'll go ahead and save that out, and our alert message lights up. And we can now go back and put a span in here. And any type of HTML or markup we'd like can go in this region, and it will render in line. So I'm just going to call this message 2.0. We'll refresh the window, go back to our, um, our index page, and we'll have our UI component right there. This is message 2.0. And again, I can put any HTML I want in here thanks to that child uh, that child markup convention that we have, the child content parameter. So now let's think about that problem statement again. We want to build a container that can have multiple alert messages in it, and then we can count the number of children that are in that container. So let's add a new component that can have multiple alerts bound to it. So I'm going to go back into my components folder, and I'm going to click Add New Item. And this time, I'm going to make a component called Alert Messages. I'm going to make this plural. And in here, I'm going to build a component that can do some data binding to a list of items. Uh, what's really nice about Blazor is we have a convention built in for this. And it is a generic, uh, generic component um, that we can pass uh, any type of object and template over that type of object. So we have the T item. So I'm going to use my code snippets again. I have B T item that I'm going to type in. And when I hit tab, if I do this in the right order, there we go. It's going to stub out uh, what I need to make this templated generic component work. And I've got a type parameter up here at the top. So this gives me a component of T. So my type parameter is of type T item. 
And you can see it's set up to iterate over an unordered list. And this is just boilerplate code that I'm going to reuse. So I'm going to take out that list item. And I'm going to leave the for each loop here because I'm going to iterate over a collection of T item. If we look at the parameters in our component, we have a render fragment of T item. And that is my item template. And I also have a, a read-only list of T item. That is my data that I'm going to send uh, this template. So now in my for each loop, I'm going to iterate over these render fragments and render them out uh, using the template. So I'm going to put in my alert message here and render out several alert messages. And inside of that alert message, I'm going to place the template that the user supplies. And what's nice about this is it's going to pass that T item back to the user and let them access any object that they pass into uh, this messages component. So now I can go back. Uh, let's actually, let's rename this before we get back into um, our next demo. Let's make sure that uh, we know what the item template is going to be. I'm going to use my refactoring tools here and hit uh, Control RR. And I'm going to rename this template region to an alert template. Now I have an alert template. We've got our changes persisting up here in the markup as well. So that's good. And I'm ready to move on to using uh, this new alert message. Now this is uh, similar, or this is the exact um, counter that you see when you do file new project. Uh, we've got the counter component. And I'm going to reuse the counter component to show just how simple we can bind a list of anything uh, to this generic collection. So right now, it's the standard counter. When I click on it, it just counts up a number. So instead of counting, what I want to do is just push those integers into a list, and we'll reuse uh, this counter component for our new demo here. So let's go ahead and remove this code block. We're going to rewrite this section anyway. So instead of counting up, I'm going to go ahead and paste in a snippet here. And I've dropped in a horizontal rule here so we can see where our new component lives. And I've got my alert messages component. And in my items property, I've bound to uh, an alert array. So we'll take a look down here. What is an array of alerts? Well, I'm simply just pushing uh, an integer into a list of int. And I'm calling that alerts. So when we click our button, we'll push those items into that alert array or collection. So next thing I need to do is uh, make sure I'm displaying the current count. You can see it's underscored up here in red. And the way to do that is just to take a little bit of a link method and stick it right there. So now we have our alert messages. And we are counting those alert messages because we're just counting simply the array of objects that we're passing in. So what's nice about this is I don't have to worry about my component trying to maintain the state of how many children it has. I'm just going to focus on the data binding and let that do the work for me. Um, also, what's nice about these templates is I can name the T item uh, field whatever I'd like through this context property. So this is something that we get out of the box with Blazor. And if you notice inside of my alert template now, I'm still rendering a span, but I have this at message property here. And that's coming from this content property that I have. If I were to erase this content property out, uh, this would need to be named context. So. I can alternatively name that just by setting this property. So now let's go back into our UI and take a look at what we have. So we're going to go back to that counter component. And instead of it just counting up uh, from 0 through whatever we click, we're going to get alert messages rendered uh, as many times as we click as well. And it's still able to keep count because we're binding to the array that's there, the list of items, and we're getting the count off of that list of items. So the next thing we're going to focus on is how to raise events with our components and look at some really easy practices that we can put in place to allow the consumer of the component to handle the events instead of trying to put 
all of the event handling logic into our component and force it to rend, um, manage the state of what's contained in it, we'll go ahead and we'll just pass that off to the user uh, with some delegate methods and let them uh, handle any events that we need. So let's add a delete button uh, to these alert boxes and let the user handle how they want to control how the alert is deleted. So that brings us to our next uh, slide here, and we're going to handle some events. So how can we implement, implement some create, update, delete operations? We're going to implement a delete operation now so I can show you how that works. And we'll do that using an event callback. So this is a special delegate that comes uh, in the box with Blazor. And this type of event handler uh, or delegate, it also invokes the state has changed method within that component. So what it does is it alerts the system that some type of state has uh, changed so the component can re-render. If we were to use an action instead of an event callback, uh, we might click on a button and we, we would be doing work in the background, but we might not see the UI update uh, along with those events that are happening. So to signal to Blazor that some, some type of event has happened, we'll use an event callback of T. T will be the object that we're going to return back to our consumer. So we'll go back into our project, and I'm going to go into my messages uh, component, and we'll add a delete functionality to it. And again, I'm going to use my Blazor code snippets, and I'm going to add a parameter of type event callback. So para EC here, hit tab, it'll auto-complete for me, and I'm going to return an object here, and we'll name this on delete. So now I've got my event callback, and I need to wire up my event callback somehow. Uh, we need to invoke the on delete delegate when something happens inside of our UI. So we'll add a simple delete method in here. So I'm going to call this void handle delete. And this is going to take a T item of item. And there is a special way to invoke this. We will call on delete dot invoke async. And we also need to pass in our argument, the item. So this will, uh, we need to trigger handle delete from within our UI. And then that will invoke the on delete method that the consumer has supplied so they can handle the delete uh, how they see fit. Um, we're going to pass back the current object um, from our UI that is bound uh, inside of that, that actual uh, record there, that, that state, that actual item that it's sitting on. Uh, so we'll pop that back uh, into uh, that argument and pass it on up to the consumer. Now, I've used T item through here and I have object here because the consumer is not going to know exactly what T item is. So we'd get an error, a uh, compilation error, if we didn't use T item here. So we'll pass back an object. You might want to create your own special event arguments for these. Uh, we're going to keep this super generic right now and just pass back an object. So now we're going to go back into, oh, sorry, we need to add a delete button. We need to invoke this event, uh, this handler. So I'm going to just paste in a delete button that I have uh, saved so you don't have to watch me type all of that out. And first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to double check and make sure the on delete uh, event callback has a delegate supplied to it. So that's just a quick way to see if there's something, uh, there's something handling that on delete method. If there isn't, I'm just not going to show the button. So when I do have a delegate, I'm going to call on click. Uh, when I when I click on the uh, button, I'm going to bind to the on click event, and I'm going to pass in the current element, and then we'll just render out a um, bootstrap button here, uh, and we've got the uh, X or time symbol inside of that button as an icon. So now we should be able to go back and look at our counter page, and we'll re-render this. So let's go ahead and run this in the browser, see what it looks like. And right now, we should be able to go back to counter, 
and click count and you'll see that I get a list of elements but there's no close button yet and that's because I put that check in there to make sure that we don't render the the close button if there's nothing to handle it so I'm going to come back into my alert messages and on delete I need to supply it with a method to handle this delete operation so what's nice about us pushing this uh, event back to the user and allowing them to handle the, the delete rather than trying to do it internally within the component is I might be binding to um, an entity framework uh, entity. I might have a web API callback that I need to make to delete an object. Uh, there's all sorts of things that I might want to do on this delete method. So we'll let the user handle it and then we'll just rebind the data. So now let's add that delete method and it's really actually simple we're going to call delete item and since it has an event callback with an item of object we'll just consume that object and we'll cast it to an int because we know that's what we're going to get back and then we'll remove it from our array of alerts so now if i rerun this just that one line of code right there that simple um, event handler of delete item that i added will give us the functionality that we need. And you can see the delete buttons appearing over here on the right hand side. And if we click on those, we can delete our items from the UI. So that's a nice way of exposing that type of functionality to your users. And again, inside of this delete item method, I could do any type of functionality that I want. And since I'm removing the items from the alert, the UI uh, is updated, removing those items through data binding. So let's look at how we can extend our app with more components in templates. Um, I'm going to go into my fetch data component now. And this is a common pattern that you'll see. We'll go ahead and run this. I've modified it slightly, so I have a little bit of a delay. So you can see the loading message uh, show in the grid right here. So that's done on purpose. I've got a task.delay right there. And if we look down in our, our on uh, initialize method, you'll see that we're waiting for, um, awaiting for uh, about two seconds. So inside of this component, we have a guard statement. So we're going to check and see if forecast is null before we render the table that is displayed on the page and if the data is null we're going to go ahead and display a loading message there this is a pretty common pattern that you see in blazor is where we're populating some kind of data from an api uh, whether it be a web api or something coming from a database and we're starting off with an empty container uh, a field of some sort that's waiting for a list of data to get bound to it and the on init method is going to run uh, with this null at the beginning. So if we take out this expression here, we're actually going to get an error uh, when we try to load this page. So we'll go ahead and rerun this here. We'll make sure our uh, code is commented out properly. And we'll give this another try. And it's going to initialize with a null uh, field for forecasts. And this page isn't going to work. So instead of implementing this null check over and over again, because I always forget to do it, I'm going to build a component that's going to handle that for us. And we can just wrap that component around objects that need to be loaded. So I'm going to go back to my components, and I'm going to add a new item. And I'm going to call this my spa loader component. This is a super simple abstraction of what we're doing uh, in this fetch data. So we're, what we basically have is an if statement. And when the, the if is uh, true, uh, we are going to show a loading message. Otherwise, we're going to show the content that we need. So we can build a really easy component to abstract this away and reuse it. So I'm just going to, instead of typing this out, I'm going to go ahead and use some copy and paste. Uh, so you don't have to watch me type that out. But it's really simple. We're going to say, if this is loading, show a loading template. Else, render the content. And again, I'm using those render fragments, the, uh, the child content 
um, to, to do this. So we have two templates. We're going to call this a loading template and a content template. And this should map pretty easily to what we're doing here. So we can take out this if statement. Well, let's go ahead and put our spa loader in here. So we have a spa loader component now. And in our spa loader, we have a loading template. And we also have a content te template. So we have loading and content. We'll move our table into the content template. And we will move our loading message into the loading template. And now we need to set uh, the is loading property on the object or on the component. And that is loading uh, is going to be a flag that is just going to check that the forecast is loaded for us. So now we've taken a, a really uh, repeatable pattern that, that we see in a lot of uh, component scenarios, and we've wrapped it in a simple container that we can reuse and eliminate the need to rewrite those if statements all over our code. And it cleans it up, makes it look like nice, uh, smooth HTML. And we can go back to our fetch data. You'll see the loading message. And now we have our table showing up. So let's take this another step further. I'm going to go ahead and remove this again. I'm going to wipe out the entire example, and I'm going to show how far along uh, we can push this concept into a nice set of reusable libraries. So I'm going to paste in a new example. This one's a little bit more complex. There's a bit more markup here, but I'm going to close out uh, some of this markup. This is mainly uh, used for the demo you're about to see, but I want to show that we have our, temp our table here again. This is the same weather forecast table as before. Uh, we're going to go ahead and show the header. And inside of the body, I've got a component called spin loader. Uh, this is something that I'm using in my project. I've taken my spa loader and I've, I've moved it down the road a little bit and gave it some more functionality. I've still got my is loading method, but I also have an is faulted method because my data may not always load correctly. So I need to be able to show an error if something happens. So now I have an extra set of templates that I can use. I also have a loading template that has a spinner in it. So I've got the spin kit uh, CSS project um, as a dependency on these components, and I can reuse this nice spinner UI um, by just calling out one of the spinner types that I'd like to render. Now, I, close, I can also set the colors of these things, uh, center them, and in my template, I can center it uh, as well within that data grid. Um, I also have a content template, which is going to loop over my uh, columns in my database, or my, my data, and render those out in the table. And then I also have a faulted template. So if something goes wrong, the user isn't stuck with a spinner that, sh that just keeps loading uh, because it's the, the data is always null. So let's take a look at this and see how it looks in our running application. So we'll go ahead and control F5 and go back. Uh, let's do a little tab bankruptcy here. Let's close all the other tabs out. Uh, let's go over to our fetch data component. You'll see I have my nice spinner there and then up pops my data. Uh, we can retry that to see it again. That's our spinner that's being provided by the SpinKit CSS. And I can also force an exception here. So if I retry, this is going to look for my data and fail. And I have a nice UI uh, display there. It's very simple, but at least it tells me that something went wrong. And I can go back and retry my, um, my refresh again. So this is a nice reusable piece of uh, component that I'd like to take and put into an external project. So that's what I'm going to do next. So under components, I have spinners. And spinners is all of my uh, components that run my spin loader. And I'm going to take these and move those into a component library project. So let's go ahead and create, uh, let's right click on our solution and do add new project and we will create a razor class library 
I'm going to click next and we'll call this spinners. And we'll click create. And it looks like I've already done that. So let's, uh, let's take a look. I've probably just got an empty folder sitting in here. We'll go ahead and drop that empty folder out of the project. So I can go back and add, uh, let's try this again, add new project. I'm going to select Razor Class Library. I'm going to name it Spinners, and I'm going to cr click Create. And we'll get a uh, new project dialog here. I'll go ahead and click Create again. And then we'll get a templated um, Razor Class Library project uh, right here in our solution. So I'm just going to drop some of these default items out of here. We're not going to need uh, component one dot razor and the interop example. We'll go ahead and remove those. And what I can do now is go into my main project and I'm going to take all of my spinners and just go ahead and cut these and paste them into my spinners project. So I'm going to remove this folder from my main project here. So I don't need that anymore. And I also need to bring over any CSS from my project. So I'm going to come in, in here. I have a libman.json file. What libman.json does, it brings in uh, third-party libraries from uh, JavaScript or CSS ecosystems. And I'm going to copy that into my uh, Razor class library as well. And I'm just going to change the output folder here. I'm going to put the uh, CSS that it's going to grab from the web and put that file in my WW root folder. And you can see it's already uh, gone out and grabbed that dependency and deposited it where I want it. And again, we'll do some tab bankruptcy here. I'm going to close these all out. So now I've moved my CSS over. I've moved all my logic over. I might need to change some namespaces because I've moved some of my code. So we'll go ahead and clean up just a few simple files here. So we're going to change any of the .cs files, but the Razor uh, components themselves will automatically inherit the namespace from the folder structure. So we don't need to change all of those. Um, I also need to make sure I include my NuGet dependencies. So I have one NuGet package that this project depends on, and it's called Blazor. Um, Blazor Component Utilities, and this is a nice uh, utility to help me do conditional styles and, and class attributes uh, for my components. So we'll go ahead and bring that in as well. And now I should be able to compile my spinner project. Let's see what output we get here. Uh, I'm missing an import statement, so I brought in my dependencies. I just need to make quick reference to those uh, in my imports.razor file here. So I'm going to say using and Blazor component utilities, and now I can build uh, my spinner project. And back in my main project, all I have to do to consume this is right click on my dependencies and hit add reference. And now I have my spinners project added to my, my local project here. I can also come into my spinner project and I can uh, right click on properties here and I can set up a quick NuGet package build. So if I check this generate NuGet package on packages on build uh, checkbox, I can save that. And when I build the project, I can then send uh, fill out this metadata and put that NuGet package up on NuGet and share that with the world. So it's just that easy to create a reusable library. Now I need to consume it inside of my uh, main project here. And I've already added it, but I need to make sure that I'm using all of the references that come with it. I need to add a reference to the style sheet. So I'm going to come back and replace uh, the existing one that I had. So it was in my CSS folder. Now it's going to be in a folder that's set up by convention. So this is going to be my content folder. So it's underscore content, the name of the assembly. It's going to be spinners, and then uh, the folder that I'm looking for in the WW root of that project. So spinkit.min.css will be there. 
and I should be able to go into my import file and change uh, this dependency here. We're going to remove this namespace and reference our spinner project instead of the internal one that we used to have. And we'll do a quick rebuild and see if we checked all the boxes. And all of our builds succeeded. And earlier I noticed there's a little bit of a caching issue that, with this. We might not see the spinner seeing that, that caching issue again. So we'll go ahead and uh, close this out. Um, let's see. We need to clean and rebuild this project. We closed out all of our browser tabs. Uh, we'll give this one more run, and we should be able to see that spinner pop up. Again, there's there's something that's being cached there that's causing it to look uh, for the old spinner um, CSS file. So we'll load this up one more time. And when we click on our fetch data page, there's our loader. So that's how you can take and create, uh, first of all, simple um, simple components. Uh, you can expose some nice APIs for your users, and you can wrap uh, some pretty interesting uh, reusable logic around some templates and make a nice experience that you can share easily on NuGet as a NuGet package library. So I don't know how we ha how we are doing on time, but I'm up for questions if we if we have any time left. Um, otherwise, back to you guys at the Channel Nine Studio. Hey Ed, yes, we do have some couple questions, so we have uh, time for that. So Beth, you, can you put the question up there? Yep, we got a question right here. All right, we'll see if we can get it up here for us. Question. Maybe there, there we go. go. All right, here's a question for you, Ed. Are there components available that make JavaScript and CSS widgets? available as Blazor components? Specifically, I'm looking for something that makes boost, Bootstrap easy with Blazor. Uh, so there's some community projects out there. There's Blazor Strap. Uh, that's one component library that wraps um, the Blazor uh, components. Okay. And we also have our Telerik UI components that are uh, fully featured um, and have uh, charts, graphs, grids, all of those things that have a bootstrap theme as well. So those two things actually mix really well together. So you can start with some of the basic stuff with Blazor Strap, and you can move on to uh, the more robust controls as you need them with the Telerik UI for Blazor. And then, of course, there is a custom theme builder within the Telerik UI components where you can start with that bootstrap theme and totally customize uh, all of the colors however you'd like. Yep. I think we have. I think we do have another. Yeah, Professor one, Sassy is asking a lot of questions. I know. Actually, Professor so. Sassy is being pretty <laughs> yeah, sassy. So you do have another one. So we got another question over here. Is there, a, is there a way to change a components tag without renaming the .razor file? Is there a, named, a way to change the components name? Without changing uh, that .razor file name. Without changing the razor file name. The extension, basically. It's just the extension. Like, for example, if, if it's called foo.razor, the component's going to call, it's going to be called foo. Can I call it foo bar, right? And then, but without changing the file name itself. So well, I don't believe we can do that directly okay. um, without changing the file name. But what we can do is we can control the component's namespace through the at namespace directive. So we can set the namespace. So uh, by default, this would be under the components folder. So it would be components.alert message. If we wanted to change that to um, alert components, it would then change the namespace. So this would now be uh, my project.alertcomponents.alert message. So we, we do have some control there, but it does still uh, get the name from uh, the razor file. Perfect. So well, at least, that's it. hey, well, that's that's great because we obviously know people on the Blazor team. That's a good feedback for them as to give them. It's like, hey, how can we actually rename these components without renaming the file structure where it sits? So that's that's great, uh, great workaround for that. Uh, any more questions, Beth? Nope, that's it. We're all done. Well, uh, Ed, uh, any parting thoughts? 
Um, I just want to say it's been uh, a lot of fun working with Blazor since uh, geez, since about one zero dot one mm-hmm. uh, when I saw it at the MVP summit. I knew it was something that uh, a lot of people were going to enjoy, so uh, we took it back to our uh, engineering team at Telerik. We've been building ever since. Um, I do a live show every Friday on Twitch. So if you follow me um, on Twitch or on Twitter, you can get updates on those shows and when they're happening. And uh, a lot of things that you saw me build today uh, came from many, many shows that we've done. Uh, so it's it's nice to distill some of that information and, and run it on Channel 9 here. Uh, you can also find the library, the sp- uh, the spinner library that I showed and the spin loader component is under the project uh, blazerpro.spinkit up on NuGet. So you can just consume that right in your project now. Um, you can also find the source code for that on, on GitHub in case you want to see how all of the uh, inner workings of that were uh, created. So it's a nice uh, boilerplate for creating your own components. Um, and then the code snippets as well, those are up on the Visual Studio Marketplace. Uh, just f- search for Blazor Pro code snippets and you should be able to find them. Perfect. Well, Ed, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh-